Okay, folks, let's get started. It's one of those days where you kind of feel bad being in and out of the weather, doesn't it? Isn't it? It's just, you wish you could be out there enjoying, you know? Hope you guys had a good weekend. Everybody's got biochemistry all down. You know, it's the first time I've ever taught this class at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and I have to say, you guys look like this most of the time. You've got to get something going here. I don't know quite what it is. All right. You probably think I look the same way, so it probably is, is equal, right? All right, so we've got some work to do. Uh, we talked last time mostly about amino acids, and uh, today I'm going to finish up amino acids, and we'll start talking about how they come together to make protein structure, and I hope to convince you in the process of doing that that there's some very interesting things to understand by understanding protein structure. I concluded last time, I believe, talking about ionizing amino acids and so forth, and we, so we saw how uh, an amino acid could go from a plus 2 to a plus 1 to a 0 to a minus 1, and uh, that also is reflected in their titration curves. So if we look at the titration curves, up, oh, got it wrong here, the titration curves of individual amino acids, what we see is something that looks like this. So each time we have a pKa value, we have a maximum buffering capacity. And that maximum buffering capacity um, for a molecule that has two ionizing groups um, will be pH specific. So if we say this guy has a pKa uh, of 9.69 for its amino group, that means within the range of about 10.69 down to about 8.69, that's going to be acting as a buffer. It's going to be resisting pH change and outside of that, it's not going to do such a nice job of being a buffer. Similarly, this same molecule will act as a buffer between about 3.34 and down to about 1.34 because a different group is involved. So molecules can have multiple groups within them, each of which have their own pKa, and those will uh, act as buffers. So amino acids are very, very good about that. Here's one that's got three, and you start putting them all up together, and you see they start... They don't do a very good job of showing this guy flattened out, but that's basically what we have is three different pKa's, one corresponding uh, to each group that's in this. Okay. Now, I think you should be able to understand titration curves, and I think you should be able to predict, say, charge. If I point to specific places on here for charge, and we talked about that last time. I'm not going to go over that again. But if you have questions about how you might look at a, at a titration curve and predict charge and so forth, please come see me, and I'll be happy to um, go through that with you. Okay. And last, there's pKa values. And students always say, oh, are you going to give us this table? And um, as I said, I tend to give simple versions of this where we might just assume, for example, that all alpha carboxyls, let's say, are about 2.2. And that's not a reasonable, an unreasonable thing. About 2.2 is probably about the average of all those guys there. We could say the alpha aminos are about this. But I would give you those values. I would say on, the, on your exam, it'll say, assume alpha carboxyls are about 2.2. And assume alpha aminos are about uh, 9.5 or something like that. So that you'll have those values. And then you could apply that to any alpha amino or any alpha carboxyl or any R group and so forth. And I'll, I'll have those values on the exam. So look at the old exam. You'll see a pretty good representation um, of uh, the kinds of things that I do with that. OK, well, amino acids, for amino acids' sake, really aren't the most important things. We've seen how they can be involved in making things like serotonin and so forth. But the most important thing that amino acids actually do is they, they are the building blocks for making proteins. Making a protein requires putting amino acids together. So we think about plastics as being polymers. And polymers, of course, are things that are built together of multiple repeating monomeric units. Proteins are polymers as well. Okay? And they don't always have repeating monomeric units. We know that they have 20 different possibilities for each position within there. But the individual amino acids are joined together in proteins, every one in the same way. They form a common bond. And that common bond is known as a peptide bond. So the peptide bond is the bond that links together the amino acids making proteins. We'll talk later in the term about where that gets made and when that gets made. But for our purposes right now, 
Our only concern will be that a peptide bond is made by joining an alpha amino to an alpha carboxyl. That's our only concern. An alpha amino to an alpha carboxyl. When we do that, water is split out. So you can see the water coming out right here. And the result is a peptide bond that has a nitrogen linked to a carbon. That's the peptide bond itself. Okay? A nitrogen linked to a carbon. Okay? Actually, this is an oxygen. I'm sorry. This is a carbon. This is a nitrogen. But in any event, the carbon and nitrogen bonds um, are what make up a peptide bond. Well, a protein may have hundreds, maybe thousands of amino acids, and every single one of those is going to uh, be linked to the other one by a peptide bond. Here is a polypeptide. So you might wonder, what's a polypeptide? What's a protein? Is a polypeptide just a short protein or what? Technically, the term protein means a functioning folded molecule, and we're not going to get into subtleties of that. So I'm going to use the term polypeptide and protein interchangeably, and you may do so as well. So we'll keep it simple. Polypeptide equals protein. This is a polypeptide. It's also a protein because it has more than one amino acid. Here's one amino acid. Here's another amino acid. Here's another amino acid. Here's another amino acid, etc., etc. When proteins are made, they're made starting at the amino end. And how do I know that's the amino end? Well, a protein only has one free alpha amino group. It's, the very, it's on the end of the very first amino acid that gets put in. Because the carboxyl of that first amino acid gets joined to the alpha amino of the next one, which gets joined to the alpha amino of the next one, of the next one, of the next one, of the next one, of the next one. So a polypeptide has an amino end, and the amino end is the only end that has a free alpha amino group. It's not joined to something else. Every other alpha amino group is, in fact, joined to something else. The other end of the polypeptide has a free alpha carboxyl group. And that is the only free alpha carboxyl group in a protein. All the others are joined together, again, in making peptide bonds. So only the farthest end, the very last amino put in, I'm sorry, the very last amino acid put in, has a carboxyl group that doesn't get attached to something else. And no, this doesn't come around and link to that. I don't know of any proteins that do that. So proteins always have a free alpha amino end and a free alpha carboxyl end. And generally, when we write them, we write them in the direction from left to right, is alpha amino to alpha carboxyl. OK, so we see peptide bonds. I keep coming back here. My mind's not working. I'm not in the mode of, of lecturing yet this week. Okay. A peptide bond is an interesting thing. Technically, it's a single bond. And if you remember from your organic chemistry, a single bond can freely rotate. There's nothing to stop it from rotating. Peptide bonds are a little bit unusual in that they have resonance with this double bond up here. And when they have resonance, those electrons up here can shift down here. Shifting down here, in fact, causes this guy to have, at least some of the time, characteristics of a double bond. So a peptide bond sometimes behaves as a double bond. Why is that important? Well, double bonds can't rotate. Can't rotate. And so what that means from a practical point of view is that every peptide bond can be thought of as a flat structure. Here's one peptide bond joining two amino acids. Here's another peptide bond joining two other amino acids. Okay. So this is flat, this is flat. In between, we have an alpha carbon here, and those have single bonds. So these guys can rotate like this, but they can't rotate within themselves because there's a double bond in the middle of my hand. So we can imagine, then, that a protein structure might be thought of as a series of peptide bond planes. One plane, the other 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 plane, etc. 
Okay? And in fact, that's a very good way of thinking of the structure of a polypeptide. A series of planes, flat structures of peptide bonds stretching all the way through a polypeptide chain. What we see then, of course, is what we think about, well, what does an amino acid have? It has an alpha carboxyl and has an alpha amino. So I've already told you they're tied up in this, in this structure here. What else does an amino acid have that gives it distinction? The R group. And so the R group, it turns out, orients itself in a very interesting fashion. Generally, they orient themselves. If my thumb is the R group, okay, in such a way as this. Here's the up. The next one goes down. Okay? We call this structure trans, even though it's not technically a trans bond, but we call this structure trans because the R groups are pointing in opposite orientations to each other. Why do you suppose that might be important? What's that? Planarity, is that what you said? Polarity? Well, polarity might play a role in that. Okay? Other, there's, there's something else that's actually a little bit more important. Interactions with each other, absolutely. Okay, So if I have these oriented like this, this might be a big group here, this might be a big group down here. They're less likely to be bumping into each other than if they're up here. Okay, That's a consideration, a big consideration. Okay, So now these guys have, some, have, have the ability to orient themselves away from each other. And even with that, what we see is that there are some interactions that can happen. This guy here might be interacting with one two away and causing a problem. That tells us then that the R groups that are sticking off of these uh, individual amino acids, these R groups will influence the structure of that protein. They may cause that structure to rotate a little bit more like this or like this so that the R groups avoid themselves as much as possible. So we do see some structural differences that happen in proteins as a function of the amino acid sequence. Some amino acids have great big bulky R groups. They're going to be pretty rigid. They're not going to have much flexibility for where they can go because they're going to start bumping into people. Just like the person that sits next to you on the plane that perhaps could go on a diet, if you know what I mean. <laughs> right? They don't have much flexibility, and as a consequence, you don't have much flexibility in your seat because you're trying to stay out of their way, and they're trying to stay out of your way. Same thing with bulky R groups. Whereas if I have small R groups, they've got a lot more flexibility. They've got a lot more possible places where they could orient themselves. Does that make sense? OK. We can actually do some simple predictions of protein structure based on these R groups that are, that, that are there, that is the sequence of amino acids. We can make some simple predictions about protein structure in a reasonably accurate fashion. OK, um, some interesting amino acids and peptides. I'm not going to um, go through those with, with a, a, couple, a couple of exceptions, but I do want to point out a couple of amino acids I did not mention in terms of interesting structure when I talked about the amino acids. So I want to make sure I do that right now. Okay. Think about these R groups again. Think about the R groups, of course, are how the amino acids vary from each other. Okay. And I said big R groups are going to have less ability to move and so forth than those with small R groups. It stands to reason that small R groups might be very interesting in terms of where they're at in a cell because they might allow a cell to have or allow a protein to have some different structures. So it's important then to know what the simplest amino acid is. And I pointed it out, but I didn't make a point, a big point of it when I talked about it before. That's the amino acid glycine. Glycine is important for a couple of reasons. Its R group is the very simplest of all. It consists of hydrogen. Now remember that the amino acid already has one hydrogen, right? We had four groups attached. We had an R group. We had a hydrogen. We had an alpha amino. We had an alpha carboxyl. But now I'm telling you that the R group of glycine is also a hydrogen. So that means that glycine has only three different things attached to it, not four. Glycine is the only of the amino acids that does not exist in the D and L forms. 